All right. Well, tomorrow will be your test over chapter chapters 16 through 18. That'll be in lesson 127. Um, we will have, by the way, uh, I mentioned this, I believe, on video yesterday. I mentioned it, I know to you students, but there will be no new material after this test. We'll just have two more days of review, lessons 128 and 129, and then the exam will be in lesson 130. So um, this are it for this quarter. And uh, three-fourths of the way down, one-fourth of the year left to go. Actually makes me kind of sad. Anyway, <laughs> makes you guys happy. It makes me kind of sad. Because um, then that means I won't be your teacher anymore after all these years. Well, you can fail if you want. Hey, there you go. Just kidding. Don't, don't do that. Don't do that. I'll be happy for you. My loss is your gain. So anyway, uh, but let's go to review some things. Going all the way back to chapter 16, have out some notes, maybe a blank page in your notes where you can jot down your test review or maybe right under where you wrote those equations at the end of the hour yesterday. And let's review. We talked about two broad categories of waves. In one type of wave, the particles will oscillate back and forth along the same line as the energy that moves. Or you could say they uh, oscillate parallel to wave direction. In class, we would call this type of wave a... Longitudinal. If they go parallel in line with the wave, that's longitudinal. If the particles are oscillating up and down as the wave propagates forward, or that is to say the particles move perpendicular to wave direction class, that's a transverse, transverse wave. So the key word there, if you're trying to do association, transverse is perpendicular and parallel or in line with, could be worded either way, would be your longitudinal waves. Uh, in a transverse wave, the high point of the wave is the... And the low point is the trough. In a longitudinal wave, the particles simply bunch up and spread out, bunch up and spread out. The bunched up part is called the compression pulse. And then the spread out phase is the rarefaction pulse. Make sure you have those terms in your review notes. Compression and rarefaction are the two alternating pulses in a longitudinal wave. By the way, it's important to know what a wave is, and we haven't reviewed this for a while. What is a wave class? It's the transfer or flow of energy through an elastic medium. The energy is traveling along, transferring from one place to another through that medium. And as the energy moves, the uh, medium will move as well, reflecting the energy flowing through it. Um, a single disturbance is called a... Wave pulse, good. So, for instance, if I just jerk the extension cord up real quick, you'll see this little up pulse, this crest, if you will, travel along the cord, propagate along the cord. If I uh, took the slinky, spread it out, just pushed it together a little bit, you'd see this compression travel along. That's a single pulse. Two opposite pulses back to back actually constitutes a wave. If you have a series of waves in the same medium, we have what's called a wave train. And in a wave train, for instance, maybe it's compressions or rarefactions traveling along this uh, medium. If I measure from compression to compression or rarefaction to rarefaction, or maybe it's transverse waves. I measure from crest to crest or trough to trough. Any point in one wave to the corresponding point in the next wave class, we call that wavelength represented by lambda measured in either meters or here in the good old U.S. of A, feet. Um... If we were to measure how far from equilibrium, so equilibrium, for instance, this nice, undisturbed state of the water, for instance. If I measure to the height of the crest or the depth of the trough, or I have this nice, undisturbed slinky, and I measure from undisturbed state to the compression area. Okay, that displacement from equilibrium is called amplitude of the wave. The amplitude of the wave is the amount of displacement from equilibrium. Um, the time it takes for a single wave to pass a given point, period. The number of waves that pass a point per second, frequency. We talked about three different types of waves as far as the way in which they travel through a medium. We said if a wave travels just in a single direction, this is usually along a, a string or cord or something, but a wave just travels in one direction, um, then we would call it a um. 
For instance, if I were speaking to you and it just traveled along a straight line to Kendall's nose, which doesn't help because she can't hear with her nose, I have to turn my head just a little to get to her ear. That would be class A, one-dimensional wave. If the wave spreads outward in all directions along a plane, that would be a two-dimensional wave. If the wave travels outward literally in all directions, that's a three-dimensional wave. Which one weakens the fastest? Three-dimensional. Remember, we did that with sound. Uh, which one does not weaken at all? One dimensional would not weaken. Um, theoretically, I mean, there's all these energy losses in some respect. But anyway, um, what type of wave is sound? Three dimensional, and it's what? Longitudinal. So three dimensional longitudinal wave. Talked about three different wave behaviors. We said as a wave is passing from one medium into another, if the wave changes speed, it will also change direction. What do we call the change in direction of a wave as it changes speed? Refraction. Okay, we can think of it as the bending of a wave, but it's simply the change in direction as it changes speed. Now we said if the wave comes in head on, then when it goes into the new medium, it will continue head on. But if it comes in at any form of an angle, then with respect to the perpendicular class called the normal, with respect to what would have been head on, the angle at which it reaches the boundary is called the angle of incidence. The angle of incidence, the angle at which a wave reaches a boundary or barrier, it's called the angle of incidence. And then, of course, if it were to not change speed at all, of course, it would just continue on its path. But if it speeds up, it will bend, it will change direction. In what way does a wave bend as it speeds up? Think about your garage. You should only speed up if you're going away from your garage. So if it speeds up, you'll see that refracted angle increase. However, if, the, uh, if it has to slow down going into the new medium, it will refract in closer. So the angle of refra refraction is less than the angle of incidence. So again, as a wave refracts, that's the bending or the change in direction of a wave. If it speeds up, it goes away from the normal, and if it slows down, it goes toward the normal. Uh, we also said when a wave strikes a surface, it will turn back into the first medium. This could even happen at a boundary in some instances where the wave will hit the boundary and go back into the first medium again. We call this reflection. Reflection is the turning back, or so you can think of the bouncing off of a wave as it strikes a surface. Uh, we said if a reflected sound wave is called... Hello! An echo, right? An echo. Do you remember how far away it has to travel for our ear to pick up on the echo to distinguish it from the original sound? 110 feet here in the U.S. is how we refer to it. We also talked about sonar and things like that as well. Um, and uh, the last type of wave behavior only applied to two- and three-dimensional waves. We said that as a wave passes through a narrow opening, uh, obviously, the wave is kind of hindered by only having that narrow opening, but it will spread back outward after passing through. And we said the spreading out of a two- or three-dimensional wave after passing through a narrow opening is called diffraction. diffraction. We said the diffraction is going to be most pronounced when the opening is how wide? About the width of a wavelength. Uh, we're going to get that most pronounced diffraction effect. By the way, remember, it was those diffraction, the diffraction of light waves that caused the interference patterns with the, you know, that we saw. Uh, speaking of interference, interference occurs when two waves collide with each other, usually from opposite directions. In general, just waves acting in the same medium at the same time, we call this <laughs> superposition. Waves acting in, at the same time in the same medium, that's just simply superposition. And a superposition results in all kinds of weirdness. But specifically, if the waves collide coming from opposite directions, and the way the book illustrated this was as the wave spreads outward, it spreads outward this one, and this one also spreads outward, so they end up colliding with each other. Colliding from opposite directions or opposing directions is a special type of superposition that we call interference in general. Three types of interference. 
If the waves collide and they actually amplify each other, produce a, a larger wave pulse, in the case of the light interference, right, we got this brighter area of light. We call that not assistive interference. They're, they're building something big out there, out in the window too. Constructive interference. There's a construction site out there. Constructive interference. Um, if, however, the waves collide and they diminish each other um, so that a smaller wave pulse is produced, we call that destructive interference. And if they completely cancel each other out at a given point, we call that complete destructive interference. You would have to have equal, uh, equal amplitudes to begin with, roughly equal wavelengths for that to happen. But again, in the case of the light, you get that to where they completely cancel each other out, and then there's dark spots in between light spots, and those were those interference patterns that we saw. Um, if we were to pass a wave along a path and have it reflect back on itself, we saw this with the microwave, remember, where the waves emanate forth from the wave director and they reflect back on themselves, they create what's called a... They will create nodes in what is called a standing wave. Remember the standing wave in the microwave? And uh, he actually put a plate of cheese in there, remember? And uh, when he turned it on, we got to see the effects of places where there was high energy melted cheese and no melted cheese at all, hence the need for the turntable. Um, but um, we uh, got those spots of no energy. That's what we call nodes. And those were the dark spots and interference. Those were the, the untouched spots in the cheese in the microwave, right? Uh, we looked at with the slinky here in class and also watched a video of the slinky there as well where we saw the spots that just didn't appear to move. Everything else was moving around. It looked like it was going up and down kind of at once um, in the standing wave. Do you remember what we call the, the loop, if you will, of the standing wave? You don't have to actually know. I was just curious if you remember the envelope. Uh, but you do need to know the term node. Um, all right, that's about it for chapter 16. Other than math, I gave you the equations yesterday. We'll take a look at some math at the end of the hour if we have time, and I assume we probably will. Let's go to chapter 17. And um, we said sound is simply a series of compressions and rarefactions that come from a source of energy. Um, how do I differentiate noise? what we perceive from sound. So the noise is what we hear. Sound is simply the, the wave itself. Um, so does a tree make a noise when it falls in a forest? There's no one around to hear it. I guess we wouldn't know there was no one there to hear the noise, but there was definitely going to be sound from the crash. Um, let's see, we talked about uh, we talked about the speed of sound. I said sound doesn't have one set speed. Light, well, even light doesn't have one set speed through a vacuum, it does. But uh, sound has a lot of different speeds depending on what's going through. Um, how fast does sound travel through a vacuum? Mm -hmm. Zero. It can't go through a vacuum. In fact, that's the only thing sound can't go through. Trick question. <laughs> Michael's like, note to self, don't be fooled on test. <laughs> yeah, sound doesn't go through a vacuum. Um, anyway, I don't know. Remember Looney Tunes cartoons? Uh, you got Sylvester and Tweety Bird. You know what I'm talking about? Okay. And Sylvester tries to get Tweety, and Tweety, every time he tries to get Tweety, he, um, Tweety Bird makes all these, these crazy noises and stuff, and, and so he, he comes back to the vacuum jar. And back in the day, people knew what a vacuum jar was. And he puts Tweety Bird in the vacuum jar, sucks the air out real quick, and Tweety Bird's like pounding and screaming and gets out a horn and crashing cymbals inside the little vacuum jar. Can't hear a thing. And uh, yes, he's got this bird. And then somehow Tweety gets out this little pin or something and somehow pokes through the glass. Don't ask me how that works, but it's cartoons. And Sylvester screams and Tweety gets away. Anyway, Tweety always gets away. Uh, <laughs> I don't know why I brought that up. But anyway, you couldn't hear anything because in a vacuum, the sound didn't travel. You can make all the compressions or effects you want, but they, well, you try, but they're not going to go anywhere. They can't. There's nothing to travel through. There's nothing to compress and rarefact. Um, air, however, sound will travel certainly through air. That's good, because otherwise you couldn't hear what I'm saying right now. Couldn't hear it if you were sleeping either, but anyway. Um, no, no noise, just, just sound is there, but you're not perceiving it. Wake up, Ken. Just kidding, she's fine. Um, how fast does sound travel through air at zero degrees Celsius, class? All right. And uh, it would be good to remember 25 degrees Celsius, because that's a commonly used number. We change that to 346. If you want to be really exact, 346.346, it keeps going. That's a good approximation. It's not hard to remember, because there's two of them. 
meters per second. But if we had others, remember we said we could use that equation we talked about in our review yesterday. That again, as we have time, we'll look at. Um, but sound travels faster through 25 degrees Celsius air because what is a factor affecting the speed of sound positively, class? Temperature. There's another factor that positively affects the speed of sound, class. Hardness, hardness, that rigidity of a substance. Again, that doesn't exactly refer to air, uh, nor to liquids, but to solids, right? The harder the solid, the more rigid the solid, the faster sound will travel through it. Um, another factor that affects the speed of sound in a negative way. Density slows down sound. Um, just yesterday, my little girl and I were coming back from Publix and pulled into the driveway and I heard a train whistle and I looked through the trees and the train's already there. I had heard it ahead of time, and uh, I was like, wow, that was, now maybe, I think we might have had the radio on, so maybe that's why I didn't hear it ahead of time, but I had that thought again of, oh yeah, it's a little bit cooler out in the evening at least, daytime, it's plenty hot, we were out there for PE yesterday, everybody was sweating, you were glistening, uh, and uh, anyway, um, but uh, um, yeah, just sound travels a little slower when it's colder out, also air is a little bit more dense when it's colder, so between those two things, air, the speed of sound slows down. Uh, we said that uh, as an object emits sound and it's moving, like the train, as it's moving forward, emitting sound with its train whistle, the uh, frequency is going to be compressed ahead of the train. Behind the train, of course, the frequency is it's more spread out. So the frequency decreases or diminishes as the wavelength spreads out. Maybe a better way to put that. We call this uh, shift in wavelength and frequency. Doppler effect, and uh, obviously the faster the object goes that makes the sound, the more compressed the waves get. Um, we even saw in the cool little video they showed like the diagram of the plane going faster and faster, the waves compressing more and more and more until the plane reaches the speed of sound. What happens to that uh, sound wave or those sound waves? Compress into each other completely and produce what's called a shock wave, which could be heard by troops at ground level as a sonic, sonic boom, or by us near Fort Benning as a sonic boom. Um, these speeds at or near the speed of, at or above the speed of sound are called supersonic speeds, also called Mach speeds. I remember they showed this uh, clip from the Concorde, it's with the Mach meter up at the front. Mach 1, everybody cheers and try to see if they get up around Mach 2. Uh, we said that sound carries energy. Sound is the flow of energy. And if we were to take, talk about the strength of a sound wave, or the energy contained in a sound wave, technically per unit temperate, unit area, we're talking class about the strength of a sound wave, the energy contained in it, the intensity of the sound wave. Now, we don't hear intensity. Class, the human ear hears loudness. loudness. What is the lowest possible intensity that the human ear can perceive? We would call this zero decibels. One E negative 12 watts per meter squared. Okay, one E negative 12, not much happening in your notes. One E negative 12 watts per meter squared. We call that the threshold of hearing. It's the lowest sound we can hear. Um, what was the threshold of pain? Anyone remember? I don't think this one's on the test, but it wouldn't hurt to review it. A full one watt per square meter would cause pain. Um, the frequencies of different sounds. How does our ear perceive these frequencies that we talked about that are shifting in the Doppler effect? Frequency is perceived as pitch. Frequency is perceived as pitch. Higher frequency, higher pitch. What's the highest frequency a healthy human ear can hear? 20,000 hertz, have the lowest frequency. 20 hertz, and again, not everybody hears on that range, but that's considered the standard uh, what we call the audio spectrum or audible spectrum. Frequencies uh, below 20 hertz that we can't hear, but whales can, I think. Infrasonic, infrasonic waves or infrasonic frequencies. And then uh, waves with frequencies above 20,000 hertz. Okay. Not hypersonic, ultrasonic. ultrasonic. Ultrasonic waves, and those are the ones used in ultrasounds. If a frequency is doubled, we have an octave higher, or frequency is cut in half, we have an octave lower. All right, there's chapter 17, we'll do some math with that here in just a little bit. Brings us to chapter 18, which should be really familiar because this is what we covered the last few days, uh, talking about light. And uh, current accepted view of light is that it is both 
a wave and a particle. When does light behave as a wave? As it travels through a medium. How, when does light behave as a stream of particles? In a vacuum or when it exchanges energy through radiation. Uh, what type of wave do we believe light travels as? An electromagnetic wave, which would be transverse or longitudinal. Transverse, but there's two perpendicular components to that transverse wave. Uh, electric oscillation and magnetic oscillation, if you will. Who first said he thought light was a wave? Christian Huygens. Um, again, why did he think light behaved as a wave? It bent and refracted like waves do. It also reflects like waves do. So observing reflection and refraction, Huygens like, it's a wave. And uh, who said, no, it's a particle? Newton. And because uh, it could go through a vacuum. So you had a point there. We already talked about interference. Who was that guy? Yeah. Thomas Young. Um, who uh, discovered this whole, who was the first one to notice that there is some um, energy beyond what we can see? Yeah, he, he, gave, he came up with the idea of the whole large spectrum, electromagnetic spectrum, but who was the first to observe, hey, we can't see light here, but there's still energy? Herschel discovered what part of the electromagnetic spectrum? Infrared. infrared rays. Again, infrared is any wave, any light waves or electromagnetic radiation with frequencies below red, right? And then anything above violet, ultraviolet. Um, we said all of this electromagnetic radiation or all these electromagnetic waves uh, are believed to travel at? The 3, 8 meters per second represented by the letter C, since we assume it to be a constant, um, these little uh, particles of light as they travel through a vacuum or as they exchange energy are called photons. And to come up with the energy contained in a single photon, we use a constant proportionality called Planck's constant, P-L-A-N-C-K, apostrophe S, constant. And um, it shows the direct proportionality between the energy that a photon has and the Energy is directly proportional to what type of weights has the highest energy? Gamma rays, highest energy because they have the highest frequency, energy and frequency directly proportional to each other. A uh, little, little bit lower energy than gamma rays, but still really high energy. See right through you. X rays. Uh, of course, uh, a little bit lower than the infrared rays we use, for instance, for remote control would be those microwaves, cooking food, a little lower energy, and then finally the radio waves have the lowest energy. The way the human eye perceives the different frequencies of visible light, color, uh, in the solar spectrum, how many monochromatic colors? Six, broken down into three primary colors, red, green, and blue. Uh, if you were to mix two uh, primaries in equal amounts, you would create a secondary. What are the three secondary colors of light? Cyan, yellow, and magenta. Uh, if you were to mix all three uh, of the primary colors of light in equal quantities, you would get white light. If you were to mix strategic primary and secondary, you could still get white if the two colors were considered to be complementary colors. Uh, we said um, that uh, whatever light is reflected from an object's surface, that is the Whatever, that's the color of the object, right? Whatever light is reflected from the surface, that's the color of the object. So the uh, pink sticker on uh, Kendall's uh, calculator there, right? It reflects pink light, uh, kind of the magenta. So it's reflecting some red and some blue light there. And uh, that's the color of the surface because that's the color that is reflected off. You can't see through that sticker. Either light is absorbed by the sticker or is reflected by the sticker, but light doesn't pass through sticker. Therefore, we say the sticker is said to be opaque. The window, on the other hand, if the blinds were open, and you kind of can see anyway, but uh, the, uh, the window, if the blinds were open, well, light from the outside comes right through to our eyes, transmitted through. We'd say that the window then is transparent, transparent, and um, 
I don't think there's anything in the room that would scatter light as it passes through, but that would be class translucent. Well, I mean, uh, it's a little bit refracted by the water bottle, which we're going to talk about, but it's still, it's not like the light isn't scattered all over the place, but I guess maybe the ridges create a little bit of a scattering effect. Um, maybe slightly translucent. Um, uh, let's see. Pigments. Pigments are designed to absorb all colors of light but what you want to reflect. Therefore, refer to pigments as being subtractive, the three subtractive primary pigments. Cyan, yellow, magenta. Cyan, yellow, and magenta. If you were to mix two of those primaries, you'd get a subtractive secondary. What are they? Red, blue, green. The idea with, for instance, red, remember, is where the yellow and the magenta both mix. Well, yellow would reflect yellow, magenta would reflect magenta. You reflect those two colors, you get red, but what the red does, it is absorbs all of the cyan uh, light, for instance, if you will, or if it absorbs the red and blue, the green and blue light, reflecting only red. If you were to mix all three primary pigments, theoretically, you would get black. All right, any questions on terms? Hopefully you wrote down the ones that you need to study and know. Let's go back now and review some things uh, from chapter 16. I gave you your equations to know yesterday. And we said the rate at which a wave travels through a medium, or the linear advance of a wave per unit time, is called the wave speed. Good. And we have two equations for wave speed. V equals lambda f. And v equals the square root of f sub t over mu. Again, f sub t class means tension. Mu means thickness, mass per unit length, but thickness, practically speaking. And suppose we had a, um, a guitar string. Supposing the guitar string was pulled with a tension of, let's just say, um, 55 newtons. And let's suppose we knew that the uh, mass per unit length, let's imagine if we had a one meter long guitar string. How much do you think about a one meter long guitar string would weigh? About the same as like three or four paper clips maybe? Eh, maybe a little bit more, maybe 10 paper clips for a one meter long guitar string, okay? So it takes about two paper clips to make a gram. If we say about 10 paper clips, about five grams, let's say it takes about 0 0.005 kilograms per meter for the mass per unit length. Hypothetically, we're making this up as we go. How fast would a wave travel through the guitar string? How fast would a wave travel through the guitar string? And uh, what is the wave speed going to be, class? 104.88. Now let's keep that number in mind. Let's do that. By the way, that's what units? Um, meters, per meters per second. Now let's take that same guitar string. Let's assume that the wave speed is 104.88 meters per second. Of course, you would technically we'd have to round this to how many say fixed class? One. Right, those zeros are not significant. So we'd have to say 100 meters per second if we were rounding that off. Let's keep the 104.88 blah, blah, blah. And let's suppose on the guitar, of course, the wavelength is determined by the uh, length of the bridge, from the bridge to the, uh, to the neck, correct? Um, let's just say that's um, 70 centimeters. So let's suppose that the wavelength determined by that is 70 centimeters, or we would say uh, 0.70 meters. The question is, what frequency would that guitar string produce? What frequency would the guitar string produce? It's a pretty low frequency. <laughs> Class? 149.8. Blah, blah, blah. Let's see, round it off. Let's go two sig figs here. Say 150 hertz, and that's a pretty low pitch. So what could we do? Well, if we increase the tension, we'd increase the speed, which would increase the frequency, right? Or if we had a thinner string, that would also increase the speed, which would increase the frequency. Because the length is kind of determined by the guitar, right? That, that's already kind of set in stone. So the tightness is what changes up that frequency there. Um, Let's suppose uh, we've got a really hot day here in the south. Um, let's suppose it is uh, 42 degrees Celsius outside. 
how fast will sound waves travel through 42 degrees Celsius air? Sig Figs class. So we'll say about 360 meters per second is how fast that wave should travel. Uh, did we get that answer? All right. Let's suppose we've got a, um, hmm. Let's suppose Kendall graduates high school and her daddy's like, you know what, Kendall? You're my baby girl, and I love you. I'm gonna take care of you. I'm gonna make sure you have a he vehicle. He doesn't actually talk like that. Let's suppose you have a he vehicle to drive. What vehicle would you like, Kendall? She's been raised well. She knows in order to go hunting, she needs a nice big pickup truck. And so she's like, I want an F-350 diesel with dual stacks on the sides, and that thing can roar. And uh, let's suppose her car roars with a frequency of, let's just say, 240 hertz. All right, so this is Kendall. Okay, we've got quad cab here, okay? This is Kendall. She can just barely see over the dash. She has a running board, all right? <laughs> and uh, so 240 hertz frequency coming out of the truck. All right, let's suppose... Um, that's Audrey. Audrey is standing there as uh, Kendall races past her at, uh, let's just say, uh, 30 point meters per second. Now, that's the first problem. Second problem is uh, Michael. <laughs> it looks like a bus. It's just an SUV. And there's Michael. And uh, <laughs> all right, it says SUV. Let's suppose Michael has his windows down. And uh, he has no eyes or anything, just that's my with a very skinny neck. And he's going toward her at uh, 20 meters per second. All right, and then let's suppose, I'm running away as fast as I can, and uh, let's suppose I can run about uh, 9.0 meters per second. The question is, what frequency do all three people here at your seats? Let's assume, good question, yeah, let's assume zero degrees Celsius for sake of ease. We'll save a step by going zero degrees Celsius on this. And let me just push this out of the way. Hey, I found a highlighter.
All right, in each case class, the F sub S is going to be 240 hertz. What if I said that these people all observed or heard at 240 hertz? That would be the F sub O. We have to multiply by the reciprocal. But most of the problems we've done have seen as S sub S. So for all of these, we're going to plug the 240 hertz in here. Uh, for the V sub R in both top and bottom class, 331.5. And uh, in the first case, uh, Audrey's just standing there. Maybe she really trusts Kendall. The Kendall will drive past and not over her. I don't know. Uh, but she, she trusts Kendall. All right, so her V sub O class, so we don't need to add anything. Minus, now do we, what is the V sub S class? The 30, is that positive or negative 30? She's approaching Audrey, so that's a positive 30. So we're gonna subtract a positive 30, which means we really subtract a 30, giving us 301. 0.5. We divide that out, we multiply by the 240 hertz. What does Audrey hear, class? 263.8, blah, blah, blah. And unfortunately, I went too sig fix, so we're going to say about 260 hertz is what Audrey hears. Do we get the first one correct? All right, for the second one, Michael. He doesn't necessarily trust Kendall, but he's like, I believe in approaching problems head on. Don't dodge it, ram it. And so anyway, <laughs> uh, I, I would love, by the way, to see like uh, an old beat up pickup truck that's like falling apart, like the fender's like barely hanging there. Have one of those don't dodge it, ram it stickers. It just be, that would crack me up. Yeah, you expect to see it on the big Dodge Ram truck or Ram trucks, not on my Dodge anymore. But anyway, uh, so uh, he is the observer. What do we plug in for his speed class? Positive or negative 20? He's going toward her, so that's a positive 20. And then her speed is again 30. And she's approaching Michael, so again, it's subtracting a positive 30. So one over the five, or three, uh, 51.5 divided by 301.5, multiply that by 240 hertz. What does Michael hear? 279.8 or rounded 280 hertz. So he hears another 20 hertz higher because he's going toward her. We don't know if there's a collision or not. Me, I don't trust Kendall at all. And so I'm running away looking for a place that I can like maybe a tree to hide behind or a building or something just to protect me from Kendall. Cause I'm like, I know she can't reach the pedals. So this, I, I know if that, that, she, if that car's moving, that means she's got something stuck on the accelerator. She's not gonna be able to get her foot off. So anyway, <laughs> I'm just picking up. Yeah. So I'm running away at nine meters per second, all right? Well, again, she is still going toward me. So her velocity is still the positive 30. My velocity of the class becomes a negative nine. So I'm adding a negative nine. So with, uh, what is that, a 222.5. Um, and I divide that by the uh, 301.5, multiply by 240 hertz. And what frequency do I hear, class? Still rounds to 260, 256.71. Still rounds to the same 260 hertz that Audrey hears, though technically it's about six or seven hertz less. Uh, my speed is not that great, so there's not a big difference between standing still and just taking one for the team and uh, running away and trying to save your own life. I don't know why that hair is sticking up off the top of my head. <laughs> all right, questions on that? <laughs> what would it make, because in all these cases, her velocity was always positive. Is the velocity of the source always positive? No. What would make her velocity negative? If she were going away. For instance, let's suppose there is young man of uh, ill fate, and um, based on when her dad finds out, he's like, wait, Kendall, I love you. Come back to me. And he's running. And is he faster than me or slower than me, Kendall, this guy who adores you that you're trying to get away from? Slower. He's slower. Okay, so she's like fat shaming him right now. <laughs> he's a fat chubby guy chasing after me. I don't want anything to do with him. So he's running after at six meters per second, let's say. At your seats, what frequency does he hear as he chases after his true love? Keep on running, buddy, because daddy's coming with a shotgun. <laughs> now, your dad would play fair with the guy, and he'd use, he'd use, he'd use a little bit of a he didn't use a rifle. <laughs> Not sporting you, but we got. Now, admirer 
is positive, she is negative, but we're adding a positive, subtracting the negative. And what frequency, what low mournful sound is he here as she drives away from him, class? 224.0 or rounded 220 depressing hertz. All right, questions on this. Such a heartbreaker. Questions on this. All right, let's see here. So that Doppler effect is big on that. Intensity of sound. Intensity of sound. Uh, here we go. We're gonna keep picking on Kendall. We like Kendall. Um, I suppose Daddy hasn't given her the pickup truck yet. So she has to make her get away on foot. And so Guy comes and asks Kendall to be his one and only. And uh, Kendall screams emphatically, no, like Darth Vader or something like that. I don't know. Anyway, so sound emanates forth. And uh, from Kendall to uh, admiring young man, uh, there's a distance. <laughs> Anyway, he's tall, he's just not dark and handsome. <laughs> That's why she's saying no. Anyway, he stands one meter away, which is just outside her reach, okay? And, <laughs> well, actually, it's a little further than just outside her reach, but anyway. He stands one meter away, and she shouts no, and um, let's see, that decibel rating. Uh, let, let's look up the decibel rating real quick, and let's see, because you all know Kendall's yelling voice, at least Audrey does. So Audrey, let's see how well we know, friend. Um, where on this chart of decibels would an emphatic, frustrated Kendall be? Obviously, I'm assuming this is a soft whisper. Where would we put Kendall? Highway truck? Oh, sorry, it's page 262. Page 262 has the decibel rating. How loud does Kendall emphatically tell this guy no, get lost? Daddy, come shoot him! All right, whatever she's yelling. Is that too? Okay, so what, what decibel rating do we want to give Kendall credit for? Nine, so let's go highway truck. Okay, so the, 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 as loud as a semi-truck roaring past you, 90 decibels is what uh, rejected young man hears. Now, daddy is over here with the gun, okay? And daddy's getting ready, and daddy hears it, but not quite as loud. Let's suppose daddy is, um, I don't know, let's say uh, 60 meters away. How loud does Daddy hear it? Okay, so there we go. That's your seats. Daddy, shoot him. Fortunately for our YouTube viewers, they don't know who Kendall is. <laughs> she doesn't actually hate men, I don't think. You know, do you? Mm -hmm. no. First, you've got to change that decibel to an intensity. Did we get 0 0.001 watts per meter squared for the intensity that young man is blasted by? It's not quite causing pain, okay? Small lungs. All right, <laughs> 0.001 watts per meter squared. Okay, keep, keep working.
do get intensity that young uh, that uh, daddy gets at uh, 2.77 e negative 7. All right, and then finally, what's that lab? Let's say it's 90 point and 60 point. Let's mm -hmm. give ourselves let's give ourselves two sigmics here. And did we get the 54 decibels? So Michael, you were with me right up to the last step. Mm -hmm. Okay. So remember, take the 2.77 e negative 7, divide by the i sub naught, where i sub 0, the 1 e negative 12, take log, and then times 10. Still not getting it? It's because I used the answer and then messed it up because it did the answer that I got. Oh. All right, while he's working on that, we feel good on the chapter 17 now. We have light with a frequency of let's say uh, 580 nanometers. Well, what is nano, by the way, to remember? Mm -hmm. E negative nine, right? So this is 580 E negative nine meters. That's the wavelength. How much energy is in a single photon? I believe this would be green light, if I'm not mistaken. I would say YouTube will correct me if I'm wrong, but I disable comments on these YouTube videos because they're made for kids. So <laughs> I guess I'll never even send me an email if I'm wrong. I think that's green light. What is the energy in a single photon? Michael, are you good now on the 54 mm -hmm. decibels? All right. We're going to take the 3.00 E8 C, divide by the wavelength, 580 E negative 9, multiply by H, which is 6.63 E negative 34. I got 3.42 blah 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 E negative 19 joules. Taking a nod from Kendall, nod from Audrey. I guess uh, two sig figs, so we just say 3.4 E negative 19 joules. And again, it's very low, but it's a single photon, and Michael's got it as well. All right, questions on the math to be prepared for tomorrow. All right, no homework other than uh, study and be ready for this test over chapter 16 through 18. You are dismissed.